Hello, welcome to this edition of Back to Gardening. I'm Val Bradley. And I'm Steve Bradley. Now gardening can be a pretty daunting prospect. Latin plant names, pruning, propagation, can be a job to know just where to start. Well, luckily, we're here to help. We're going to get our hands dirty with practical gardening techniques. We're going to go behind the scenes of the horticultural industry. And we're going to show you what you can do and when you should do it. We want to make your garden the best it can be. On today's programme, we'll take you for an exclusive tour around a nursery in Sussex for a first-hand look at commercial cut flower production in the UK. And then later, for our product review, we'll be looking at one of the most essential tools in the garden, the humble pair of secateurs. We'll show you what to look for, which ones to avoid, and how to keep them in tip-top condition. And of course, we'll be answering some of the questions that you've sent in to us. But first, winter's nobody's favourite time of year, and it can make your garden and patio look really quite sad. So for this week's practical project, Val's going to make a winter container to perk up your patio and give colour and interest right through into the spring. Making your own container to give you colour through the winter months is very easy and it needn't be expensive. Your local garden centre should have a range of suitable plants, so what you choose to put in your basket is entirely up to you. I'm going to use this six pack of violas, a large winter flowering heather, a pretty variegated ivy and two packs of dwarf spring flowering bulbs. The container I'm using here has a built-in water reservoir in the base. This is much less important in winter, but it's useful if you want to put your container under an overhang or in a cold porch. I'm going to use a light, free-draining, multi-purpose compost because I don't want the container to get waterlogged if it's a wet winter. Unlike summer containers where a shortage of food and water will affect the growth, there's no need to add moisture-retaining gel to the compost or mix any fertiliser in. The plants you're using at this time of year will continue growing, but only slowly, thanks to the low temperatures and short days. Fill the pot about half full and add your first bulbs. As a guide, most bulbs should be planted about three times deeper than they are high. I'm using a narcissus here called February Gold, which grows to about 12 inches high and flowers in March. The attraction of adding bulbs is that they'll come up and flower just as you're getting tired of the pot looking the same. Cover the bulbs and add more compost. Now, position your first plant. This heather is just coming into flower, but even once it's finished, the foliage will look pretty, especially when it's frosty. Add a little bit more compost, because the other flowers are going to be smaller. This is a small flowered viola that should produce lots of coloured flowers forming right through the winter. Simply ease the plants out of the tray by pushing the base and handle them by the compost so that you don't damage the tops. Position the plants evenly around the container. Angle them slightly outwards so that they grow over the edge and hide it. Now I'm going to add some crocus and this is a striking early variety called Prince Klaus. Plant these in between the violas, allowing each room to grow. Finally, I'm going to add the ivy. This pot of ivy is actually made up of several rooted cuttings, which I'm going to split up and put around the container as I fill it up. All that's left to do now is water the container well to settle the compost, and if you notice any holes as it settles, top them up. So there you have it, a quick and easy way to add some much needed colour and interest through the winter and into the early spring. Now there's no excuse for having a boring patio during the winter months especially as you can reuse the plants in your border next year. Now, most people enjoy plants and enjoy gardening, but have no idea what happens to the things they buy before they reach the garden centre or shop. So, as part of our Behind the Scenes series, we've been to visit a nursery in the south of England to give you a first-hand look at commercial cut flower production in the UK. We've all seen the display of flowers at the supermarket, maybe even bought some, but have you ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes and how the flowers are grown so perfectly? Welcome to Donaldson's in Sussex. 
This is one of the last producers of chrysanthemums as cut flowers in the UK because most blooms are now brought in from abroad in refrigerated lorries. This huge greenhouse covers 10 acres, or the size of 10 football pitches, and it produces 17 million cut stems every year. Your bunch of flowers starts out as a bag of tiny, unrooted cuttings like these. In winter, there are only about six tolerant varieties being grown, but in the warmer days of summer, there can be up to 20. These preformed cakes of compost are the same type that salad growers use for their lettuces. After unpacking the cuttings and dipping the bases in rooting powder, the cuttings are inserted into the compost blocks. The workers work quickly and efficiently, so almost every single cutting will grow. The completed trays are laid down and covered with plastic sheeting. This increases both the heat and the humidity around the trays, which helps the cuttings to root more quickly. Heating cables under the floor keep the cuttings at a steady 21 degrees C. After the first week, the plastic can be removed to allow the leaves to dry a little. If they stay too wet, they may rot. After another week on this floor, the cuttings have rooted and are ready to move on. Once they have rooted, they need planting as soon as possible so they continue growing quickly. The cuttings are not actually planted. They're placed on the surface of the prepared soil so that they can root down. Believe it or not, between 36 and 50,000 can be laid out every day, depending on the season. Every available inch of space is used for plants, because paths are not essential in this greenhouse, where overhead gantries allow the workers to stand the plants down without worrying where their feet are. The planting density varies according to the season, from 60 to 96%. This is the winter spacing, so there are gaps to allow light to reach all the plants. Extra mesh can be laid down where paths would run to allow more planting space. Both heat and carbon dioxide are supplied in pipes at soil level to make sure that conditions are perfect for quick growth. There are overhead heaters too, but these are only needed if the air temperature falls from its normal steady 18.5 degrees C. The south of England has the best light levels, which is why so many nurseries and growers are based here but even so, bright lights are used to supplement the natural daylight and keep the plants growing quickly. Watering is also done from overhead and can be adjusted to suit the size of the plants and the season. These wire support grids are raised as the plants grow to keep the stems nice and straight. This saves the need to stake or tie the plants continually as they get bigger, a task that gets progressively more difficult as the plants grow and there's less room to work between them. These are spray croissants, which will have a cluster of flowers all open at once, rather than having a single larger bloom at the top. In order to make this happen, these workers are nipping the top bud out to encourage the lower buds to develop. This is exactly the same sort of technique you might use at home to make a plant more bushy. In just a few weeks, the blooms open into flowers, giving a carpet of colour across the greenhouse. The flowers are ready for cutting after about 52 days in summer and between 60 and 65 days in winter. Slight differences between varieties mean that they don't always flower exactly in sequence, so it's down to the skill of the technical manager, Andy, to work out when the flowers are ready to cut. A movable conveyor belt is pulled into position alongside the row to be cut, ready for the process to start. This machine is used to separate and cut flowers. It runs along the floor so that each stem is cut at the same length. The battery powered cutter makes its way down the rows, cutting each stem in its sharp jaws as it goes. Each worker collects five stems together and lays them on the belt. This takes them to a second mobile belt, which transports them to the really ingenious bit. Underneath the main pathway hides a long conveyor that will take the flowers for packing. It's accessed through grids at regular intervals, but means that the main pathway is always clear for machinery and staff to use. Once the flowers have been cut, the bed is cleared and cultivated to remove the old debris and prepare it for the new plants that will follow within days. Twice a year, the beds are sterilised with steam to keep them free from pests and diseases. 
At the far end of the greenhouse, the flowers emerge and are taken up into the packing area. They're checked and put into plastic sleeves. They're packed into boxes and then into a chilled lorry that will take them to a warehouse where they're labelled and have a sachet of food attached. From there, they'll go to the various distribution centres for the supermarkets, ready to go into the stores. So, next time you see a bunch of croissants in the supermarket, you'll know how it was done. That was impressive. Do they really produce 17 million stems a year? Yes, they do. It works out as a staggering 46,500 a day. So I've got no excuse when it comes around to our anniversary. <laughs> One thing we're often asked by gardeners is which secateurs they should buy. So for our product review, I've been sharpening up on secateurs to see if we can help. Whether you're deadheading in the summer or pruning during the winter, secateurs are one of the most indispensable tools that we use in the garden. They've actually been around for quite a long time. These are older types of secateurs from the last 150 years or so. And as you can see, some haven't changed all that much over the years. The Victorian gardeners would use different secateurs for just about every job. The secateurs would have been made locally by the blacksmith, which led to variations from area to area, but the basic design was largely very much the same. Some of the blades have been refined as manufacturing techniques and materials have changed. Today we tend to see less variety, and the main difference between the types is simply the cutting action. These bypass secateurs have two blades which pass each other very closely, like a pair of scissors. The upper blade is convex and the lower one either concave or straight, which gives a clean cut through most plant material. Anvil secateurs have a blade that cuts against a flat surface. These have the disadvantage of slightly crushing the stem rather than cutting it cleanly. However, they are lower maintenance because they will work even when they are slightly blunt. Parrotbill secateurs use two concave passing blades which trap the stem to make the cut. These are suitable only for narrower stems. These days people tend to use the one pair for every job so it's important to get the right ones. It may sound obvious but you need to make sure that they fit your hand. You pick up a pair before you buy them, hold them and make sure they feel comfortable. If you're left-handed like me, make sure you get a left-handed pair. There are lots of pairs available now, so there's plenty of choice. Remember, like everything else, with gardening equipment you get what you pay for. So if you see a pair of secateurs at $4.99, you know they're not going to be the best quality, but there's also a chance that they won't cut very well and you can injure your hands while you're using them. Once you've got them, it makes sense to look after them. Clean, well-maintained secateurs cut cleanly and easily, which reduces the pressure on your hands and wrists. Wipe them to remove any sap after you use them and rub them with oil at least once a year. If you forget, they get black and sticky. One quick tip is to clean them by covering the blades with brown sauce and leaving it overnight. Then washing it off and polishing them with a soft cloth the following morning. Some companies will take their secateurs in for a complete service if you feel yours need more attention. Be careful with your secateurs and don't be unrealistic about what they can cut through. The easiest way to ruin them is to try and cut through a branch that really should be cut using a saw or loppers. A good pair of secateurs will last a lifetime, especially if you look after them properly. There are a few innovations that have come onto the market in recent years. Ratchet secateurs use a mechanism to increase the force from your hand. As you can see, they are a bit more heavy duty than normal secateurs. 
They are designed for cutting through thicker stems and thin branches up to about one inch thick. And these are electric secateurs. They really take the effort out of pruning by using a battery powered blade. All you need to do is pull the trigger and the blade will cut stems up to an inch thick. So now you know a bit more about secateurs so you should be ready and rearing to go for next season's pruning. Now we come to the part of the programme where we try to answer some of the questions that you've sent in. Every week we ask you to tell us about the problems you're having with your own garden to see if we can help. Our first letter this week comes from Julie in York who's having trouble with her orchids. Dear Val and Steve, I have been given an orchid by a friend and I have no idea what to do with it. Please help. Well Julie, I really like orchids and I've collected quite a few over the years so I went into our greenhouse to see if I can help. Orchids have gone from being expensive specialist plants to one of the most popular houseplants in the country. This is thanks to improvements in propagation techniques that have increased the range available, the colours and most of all the price. One of the most commonly available orchids is the moth orchid or Phalaenopsis. This is a warm growing orchid that needs a temperature between 16 and 30 degrees C but ideally should stay around 21. They're sold in translucent pots because the roots need light. Your plant should last in a 12 cm pot like this for at least its first year. You can see one of the main roots through the pot. They need good light but not direct sun which could scorch them. These orchids also have aerial roots which can absorb moisture and nutrients from the air. It's important not to damage these or they can rot. You only need to water once or twice a week because these plants don't like being too wet. You can mist them in summer, but never let the water sit in the centre of the plant for too long or that can cause rotting. Here you can see the effect of overwatering. The tip of the leaf has died right back. These orchids naturally grow in the angle of a tree branch in tropical forests where the flower stems arch downwards. Well, this isn't ideal in the house, so we tend to stake them to grow upright. There are numerous ties available, but I like these self-sticking ones because they're nice and soft on the stems. You can also use plastic or plastic-covered wire clips, but as with any firm tie, always loosen it in good time before it bites into the stem. The flowers will open in succession along the stem, and when the first flush finishes, you may find that a second flush of buds will develop at the tip. If not, then you can cut the stem back to just above the node below the flowers. This helps to make the bud inside develop into a second flowering shoot. Don't worry if the stem dies back a little like this one. The new shoot should soon develop from here. Sometimes a new flower shoot grows from the base, like this one. To grow well, your orchid will need repotting in orchid compost and feeding regularly. This will make sure it stays in good condition and produces more flowers. So, there we are. I hope that helps answer your question. And I hope you have many happy years with your orchids, just as I have with these. Our next question comes from John in Hampshire. Dear Val and Steve, I want to grow rhododendrons, but my neighbour says we have the wrong type of soil. What does this mean and is there any way to fix it? OK, well since soil is pretty fundamental to growing plants, I've been out in the garden to see if I can dig up some answers. Oh, that's terrible! Yeah, no, I couldn't help myself. Oh. <laughs> Every plant has a range of soil conditions in which it will thrive, another in which it will survive and a few in which it is likely to die. These can include sun or shade, dry or wet, but in the case of rhododendrons, particularly includes pH. This is a system of measuring whether the soil is acid or alkaline and is shown on a scale of 0 to 14 or as colours on a chart. The lower end of the scale, which is usually depicted as red, is acid, whereas the higher end is alkaline and is usually shown as purple. You may have memories of doing this at school. It's exactly the same principle. Gardeners only use the middle part of the scale from 4 to around about 8 Soils in the region of 6.5 to 7 are classed as neutral and will suit the widest range of plants. Most rhododendrons prefer a pH of around 5.5 to 6, so it's worth testing your soil to find out what you've got. You can get a small kit like this in the garden centre. 
and as well as containing all the chemicals you need, it will also have a full set of instructions on how to use it. So you don't have to worry about remembering your school chemistry lessons. Today I'm actually going to use a slightly larger kit because I want to take several different samples. These kits are also readily available, however they do cost a little bit more. The first thing you need to do is take a sample of soil from where you want to plant the rhododendron. Dig down 3 to 4 inches to get a true reading. Place the soil sample in the small tube. Next I'm adding barium sulphate powder using a small spoon. Be careful not to spill any. Now I'm adding the test solution and I'm going to fasten down the plastic cap. Give it a good shake for about a minute and then leave it to settle for 10 to 15 minutes. As well as this border I've also taken samples from a few other areas to show how the variations in soil are shown on a pH test. You can see this sample has turned a definite red shade so it's very acidic. This sample however is quite definitely alkaline. If you find that your test shows your soil is too alkaline, you have two options for growing rhododendrons. You can keep the plant in a container where you can use an ericaceous or acidic compost or you can still plant the rhododendron in the garden and add an acidifying product such as sulphur to the soil. Don't forget that even watering your plant with tap water will raise the pH so try to use rainwater if you possibly can. That's all we've got time for today, but join us next time when we'll be taking a trip to the last remaining Drop Forge gardening tool producer in the UK. And I'll be showing you how to graft mistletoe onto a fruit tree. And of course, we'll be answering some more of the questions that you've sent in. So until then, goodbye. Bye.